Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the United Nations building. As I look around, I see a number of uh, colleagues who have uh, spent many years in the trenches on the human trafficking front. There are, of course, also in the audience uh, some individuals who are perhaps new to this, to this struggle and whose strength and energy uh, we can well do with. I'm very, very happy, and the United Nations is honored today to be joined in the launch of this important product, this important tool by Ambassador de Baca, who was just introduced. This, for us, marks an important uh, engagement and a shouldering of joint responsibility for tackling a crime that is, it seems to many, spreading its tentacles across the planet. Uh, conclude by using the phrase, from my perspective, that what this requires is joint, act joint action and joint effort. For a network to be defeated, it takes another network of civil society. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all, and um, thank you, Gary, uh, for um, the uh, kind remarks for all of us uh, who are in the expert groups. Uh, the, one of the things that I think that uh, those late nights uh, in uh, a relatively stuffy conference room uh, in Vienna uh, resulted in uh, was uh, something that hopefully uh, allows us to tell the stories. Um, at the end of the day, I think what we're dealing with here is a situation in which uh, we've got people, um, whether we call them victims uh, or whether we call them workers, uh, hopefully later we call them survivors, um, but we've got people who, uh, through coercion, through force, through uh, isolation, um, have to some degree not just lost their freedom, but have lost their ability to tell their story. And at the end of the day, that's really what we ask uh, of the prosecutor, of the investigator, is that we have to go back in time, we have to look into history, we have to find that story, and we have to tell that story to the court. We have to tell that story, um, if we're in uh, particular legal systems, we have to tell that story to the jury. And so we have to be the voice, we have to find the voice that was denied those people by their traffickers, by their employers, by their pimps. And so I think that one of the things that we see is the notion of the voices of the practitioners, the voices of the investigators being reflected in this manual uh, so that we can actually build that network that Gary talks about. When I first started working on uh, human trafficking cases uh, back when we uh, didn't call it that, um, in the involuntary servitude and slavery program of the Civil Rights Division at, at the Justice Department, um, we used to joke that we could have a, a national anti-trafficking conference uh, in a minivan uh, because there was not that big of a network yet. Um, in fact, a minivan might have had several extra seats left over uh, at the time. Um, but later, as we came to meet our colleagues, we realized actually that there was a network, a network of people who had been working these cases. There's cases that we continue to use as um, in court, um, that we give to the judges, that, that we argue the law from, uh, cases that were prosecuted 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And that case law is as relevant now uh, as it was uh, back then. Because what we see is, whether we call it slavery, whether we call it exploitation, whether we call it human trafficking, uh, that this has been going on uh, for as long as people think about crime. Uh, and uh, before, uh, this is the type of crime that probably made people start to say no. You're not going to do this. You're not going to victimize uh, our people in this way. Um, now, this manual, as, I, as uh, I've said, represents a substantial step forward in our ability to tell those stories. Um, it was carefully developed over a two-year period, and it reflects the experience of over 45 judges, prosecutors, and academicians, uh, representatives from non-governmental organizations, international organizations. Um, and as was noticed, uh, I uh, was there. I was. Uh, um, uh, part of the process, and, and sometimes those uh, discussions could be intense. Uh, countries uh, who uh, felt that trafficking uh, should be viewed as a migrant issue, or, or countries that felt that trafficking required uh, some type of movement, 
uh, other countries who uh, felt that uh, the exploitation and the enslavement uh, of the person uh, was where the focus should be. Um, but at the end of the day, all practitioners who had seen these cases, who had been touched by these cases, and were trying to come up with a unified understanding of how we can tell those stories. One of the things that I think that is important about this, is that this manual is that notion of providing the type of mentoring that we have not had the, the opportunity uh, in so many countries to have, because this is seen as, as such a relatively new issue. Uh, most attorneys, uh, most prosecutors, uh, and most investigators learn uh, from the older uh, people. They learn from the person who they try their first case with. They learn from that sergeant or that commander who takes them under their wing and shows them how to investigate the cases. But this is an area of law that in so many countries has not been investigated, it's not been taken into court, that there isn't that type of mentor, one-to-one -one mentoring uh, that can be done. And so this manual attempts to do that uh, by providing the expertise of, of these practitioners. Um, and in doing so, um, supports the prevention, the protection, and the prosecution that are at the heart of the Palermo Protocol. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting as well is because it's put together in, in modular uh, form, practitioners, practitioners can actually uh, select which mod modules are being used, uh, which are the, the most effective for their own uh, particular needs. And one of the things that I think that, that we sometimes see is that by differentiating so much between sex trafficking and forced labor, we end up missing an awful lot of sex slavery. Because I have to say that the number one predictor in the cases that I investigated and prosecuted as to whether or not there was going to be ongoing, long-term sexual servitude was not whether or not it was in prostitution or in strip clubs or other parts of the so-called sex industry. Rather, it was whether or not the victim was a woman. So in conclusion, I think that I would, um, on behalf, uh, I will presume, uh, to, on behalf of the practitioners who contributed to this, um, to urge all of us to reinvigorate uh, our commitment uh, and our activities in the fight against uh, modern slavery. On behalf of President Obama and the United States, um, I urge all of us to work in partnership uh, and commit the United States uh, to be there as partners uh, for you in that struggle. On behalf of, of myself, the survivors uh, with whom I've worked, um, I urge impatience. We do not have time. We do not have time to think about trafficking. We do not have time to mull over trafficking. We do not have time to argue about trafficking. There are too many people, thousands, maybe even millions, who wait today for somebody to come and help them. And if not us, who will? So again, thank you. So thank you very much, Ambassador. At this point, what we'd like to try to do is to uh, trigger an e-launch of the of the report. But if that doesn't work, we do have we do have a traditional backup plan. So I'm last second try, which looks kind of like this. Um, if I can, why don't we? Uh, if you want to look at the screen, that mouse and you click on that thing, I'm told that even though the signal strength is low, I, we should, uh, here's, the, here's the UN at work on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I'm worried, of course, because the Google uh, advertisements, you know, they, they practice, so who knows what kind of bad one is. So we beat it at a test first. Okay, but that is it, launch. Wonderful. Yeah.